this morning we're going to show a couple testimonials and Emily's going to come up, give a quick ministry update on Go Give Hope, and then I have a short message. Jeff said, take as long as you need, so I figure like four hours should be pretty good. And then we'll have lunch, and then we'll come back. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I do want to warn you, the second testimonial video with the lady in it has some mature content in it. It could be a little uncomfortable for some people, but it's the reality of what's going on there. So... Just a heads up on that. If you have kids and you don't want to hear it, there's some um, things in there. So, um, but Emily, I'll have you come up and we'll give you an update on what's going on with Go Give Hope. Uh, we are recording this, so we're gonna hopefully put it online so the testimonials and the updates can encourage people. But we'll be speaking in generalities, so you guys know where we're working. I will try not to give too many specifics. So if you're like, why are they saying it like that? Those weirdos. That's why. All right. Thank you, Stanley. Good morning. Good morning. I'm very excited to see you all. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, Pastor Jeff. If you are watching, I, I'm sure you are watching right now. I can tell. All right. all right. Take your own time. We cut this, okay? And uh, next Sunday, too, we'll cover for you. Don't worry. Yeah, you can go vacation or whatever, we, we can do this. So thank you again. Um, I'd like to give you guys a little bit update on Go Give Hope, what's happening around the globe. We want to show this live just because we have some wonderful testimony. And people, those are not able to come and watching online they might be blessed by this. So we're trying to uh, not mention where and all that stuff. So just bear with us this morning, okay? Um, I'll be going back to India. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Mute it. I'm going back to Asia uh, this October. Um, I'm just waiting for my U.S. passport to renew, and then I will get my ticket, and I'll fly out very soon. Um, and Stanley and David will join me first week of November, and we'll try to come back before Thanksgiving. We also have a fundraiser, Cool Kid for Fundraiser, coming up December 6th. We have give responsibility to the team. They will update you and give all the information that you need. So watch out for that too. Um, Go Give Hope, first time Go Give Hope magazine is coming out this winter. So watch out for that too. It will be full of testimony like what you are going to see today, okay? So pray for that, that without any delay, it will come out. This magazine has two purposes. One is to glorify God for what he has done through people's life. Second is this can be used as a tool to reach other people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? At the same time, those who are believers already, we are, will be placed by that. And we can go out and share those testimony to others. Okay? So this is the double-edged sword. Okay? So this is going to be amazing. And we will continue to publish every year, once in a year, uh, in the years to come. So, yeah, the Lord is amazing. You know... You just sit here, this part of the world, and you are doing your best to pray for those people and sending some resources. You are playing a very crucial part in your life, okay? I just want you to know that, okay? While we have time, short time in this earth, we must serve him the pace of our portion, 
that's very important in your doing it. And I am grateful and thankful to the Lord that you all are not spectator, but also participant. And that's the best that we can do, okay? Time will pass by very fast. But while we are in this earth, very soon, and we know that the sun is going down. Sun is going down. The birds are coming to the nest. We see it, okay? We also see the cows are coming home. <laughs> that we don't have that, that saying, but I copy from this from you guys, so. <laughs> okay. It doesn't make sense to me, but. Uh, <laughs> but it does make sense to you, so that's great. Awesome. Yeah. And then, each day, each week, each month, each year, it's getting darker and darker. You see that? So that means we need to hurry it up and do our best diligently. So I just want to encourage all of you to continue to do so, okay? This is very important. This is very serious. We are not doing this out of compulsion. We are doing this out of love and joy for what he has done for us. And there's millions of people out there just waiting, waiting, okay? So I just wanted to give you just really quick update. The Lord is doing amazing stuff. I've been in contact with all of our workers every day. Morning, couple of hours, evening, couple of hours. Well, when they go to work, I talk to them. When they come back from the field, I talk to them. And I get all the amazing stories. I wish I have hours and hours to tell you guys. But we don't have a lot of time. So I just wanted to let you know that God is doing amazing stuff. Wonderful stuff. Okay? Now, some of you have generously given some resources to buy a bicycle to our church blenders. They are saying that, oh, thank you so much. I've been praying for this for a long time. This bicycle is don't give for Jesus. I'm going to take this and go and preach the gospel. Now, they were able to go to the more villages, go further to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people are getting saved and disciple and planting churches. So amazing stuff is happening. Some of you have donated resources to buy a Bible. And it's a wonderful thing. They don't have Bible. They were not able to afford Bible, many of them. So now we could able to give to each new believers a Bible as a gift and tell them, welcome to the kingdom of God. And they are reading it and feeding their spiritual life and getting fit and also the whatever they learn they go and share that to others it's a wonderful thing and i can tell story and story but time is very short so thank you for all you have been praying and supporting all those church planters in their this ministry god bless you all you know, here in this country that we live in, we think that our spiritual warfare is up. Our freedom is taken away. We need to fight for it. That, we feel like that spiritual warfare. But in India, this spiritual warfare is to the next level. They are physically wrestling with the enemy. Okay, you are going to witness that. Literally, they are fighting. Okay, so I want you guys to understand that. Watch this and glorify, glorify God and be blessed by this video. Okay, thank you very much. God bless you all.
My name is Harbert Teron, and I am the head of my village, Sir Dongkimi, also known as Chai Dili. My father died due to an attack of witchcraft. And within a month, three of our family members passed away. We were in deep distress during that time. And despite our efforts with various pujas and pagan rituals, we found no relief. Two years after my father's death, I got married. However, three months later, my wife fell victim to witchcraft and became bedridden. Her health deteriorated rapidly, and she became extremely thin. We visited numerous temples and consulted witch doctors, but her condition did not improve. We then sought help from Mr. Harv Bay, a pagan priest. After performing certain rituals, he informed me that the gods of our house had been detained and tied up due to the witchcraft. He instructed me to rescue them by donating 25 rupees. I complied, and the gods were freed from detention. Despite this, I was disappointed, as it seemed that my gods had limitations and that I had more authority than them. This experience led to doubts about my understanding of the divine. The priest also recommended performing the final certain rituals to counter the witchcraft. I purchased nine chickens, one pig, one black goat, and one carton of eggs for the ritual. A priest from Chilangabi was invited to conduct the rituals. The ceremony was held at night. And although my wife initially recovered, her illness recurred after two to three weeks, or approximately a month. In 2007, I consulted a fortune teller. He was hesitant to speak due to my perceived bad fortune. Later, he sent a messenger to inform me that my wife would not survive beyond three days. I was shocked and deeply anguished, as we were newly married and I loved my wife dearly. Feeling helpless, we decided to seek help from a Christian prayer center. I borrowed money from friends and relatives to cover travel expenses and took my wife to a Christian prayer center. We met a prayer warrior who prayed for my wife. After a week of prayer, my wife was completely healed. Upon our return home, I told a prayer warrior that we could not forget the love of Jesus Christ. We would place our faith in him regardless of our circumstances, whether in life or death. Upon our return to the village, I felt content, however. The villagers were not receptive to Christianity. They convened a meeting and summoned me to provide an explanation. For my safety, I took refuge in the mountains. Although I observed them from afar, they were unable to see me. The following day, another meeting was convened. I attended and was warned to abandon my faith in Jesus or face the destruction of my home. I firmly refused to renounce Jesus and was falsely accused of accepting bribes. In truth, I was not motivated by money or riches. My faith was rooted in my personal experiences of Christ's love and mercy. That night, the villagers completely destroyed my house, property, and paddy. By God's grace, a dark cloud formed and brought rain, which dispersed the crowd. 
With no place to stay in the village, we lived in a remote jungle for four years, coexisting with wild elephants. Remarkably, the elephants did not harm us or damage any of my broom plantations, whereas they destroyed the broom plantations of the villagers. This experience affirmed to me that God is with me and cares for me. Although the villagers had seized my paddy fields and prohibited me from cultivating rice, I now possess five to six hectares of land in another location, including a paddy field. I have faith that Jesus Christ is my provider. When I first put my faith in Jesus Christ, the villagers were hostile and I faced significant challenges. Despite all those challenges, one night I was unable to sleep and suddenly beheld Jesus Christ in the sky, weeping. His tears fell upon my chest and I was profoundly astonished. Subsequently, all my pain and difficulties gradually subsided. This shows how much Jesus Christ loves our family. My name is Sumi Terampi, residing in Matapang, Difu. My husband is Bird Johansi. I wish to present my story from when I was 25 years old. I frequently suffered from nightmares and encountered significant difficulty with sleep. My dreams frequently involved being chased and bitten by snakes, leading to intense physical reactions such as screaming and calling for help. These incidents happened two to three times a week and lasted for about two to three years. Additionally, I was disturbed by a spirit of short stature who would pull up my blanket and disrupt my sleep and trying to interact in a playful manner. Despite discussing these issues with friends, they considered them to be just dreams. However, my health continued to deteriorate, and I became increasingly weak and thin. I visited various temples and followed all the rituals recommended by the priests. Despite exhausting our savings, my problem persisted. I was unable to walk or engage in activities like other girls and was treated at GD nursing home in Naganj. However, the nightmares continued. I was taken to Dibergar Medical College for an examination where they performed a CT scan and ultrasound and all the results showed to be normal. Some people asserted that I was lying, while others claimed I had gone mad. After a few few more days, I began to experience dreams where I lived and played with a snake. One day, while playing with my young cousin, I kissed him on the cheek. Shortly after, I noticed that black marks, resembling blood clots, appeared where I had kissed him. After a few more years, I entered womanhood and got married. One evening, I suddenly felt unwell and lost consciousness. When I awoke, I found my mother-in-law, father-in-law, and several villagers around me. They informed me that I had screamed and yelled loudly. I was scared, as I had never experienced anything like this before. My relatives consulted a fortune teller. It was believed that my soul was being held captive and that I would die during the Durga Puja festival. Over time, I developed a strong dislike for my husband and the people around me. 
and I also disliked being confined at home. At times, I lost control, removed my clothes and jewelry, and wanted to roam around naked. My husband did his best to control my behavior. At night, my dreams solely featured my husband, and I no longer saw the snake. In the dreams, he would come to me, show affection, kiss me, and be intimate with me. However, when I woke up in the morning, I noticed unusual black marks on my body where he had touched me in the dream. I then realized that he was not my husband, but an evil spirit. The nightmares became very frequent, occurring three to four times a week. I was seduced by him and engaged in physical relations with him in my dreams. When I woke up, I felt pain and discomfort in my private area, which persisted for several days. For two consecutive months, I was a victim of sexual harassment by Satan. We felt hopeless and were unsure of what to do next. My brother offered comfort with words of hope in God, but we were uncertain which God to trust. My younger brother had seen on TV and the Internet that Christian people perform exorcisms. He suggested that we invite Christian people to pray for me. We all agreed, and they came to offer their prayers. During the prayer session, I lost consciousness again and began screaming and yelling. I finally had a restful sleep. The next day, my issues resurfaced. I was told about a tree in the backyard, downhill, and urged to jump from its top, and after my death I would be contented. After that, I fled from home. I leaped over the fence and made my way toward the tree downhill. I was screaming loudly. My forehead struck a bamboo tree, and I was dragged toward it. My clothes were torn off, leaving me naked. My body was covered in wounds. The Christians prayed over me and sprinkled holy water on me. Miraculously, all the pain disappeared immediately after the prayer. I was amazed to witness the power of Jesus Christ and felt very grateful. Without delay, I made a firm decision to believe in Jesus Christ, and the Christians promised to continue praying for me. Something mysterious happened at midnight. A terrifying supernatural being appeared to me and struck me on my body. It was enormous and so heavy that I couldn't endure it. The supernatural being had long hair. It wasn't just a nightmare, it was real, and I was extremely frightened. I accepted Jesus Christ in June 2014. Since my baptism in 2014, there has been no sign of the supernatural being returning to my life. Day or night, I am free from fear and trauma. Now, my husband and I have two children and our family is filled with peace and happiness. Jesus has not only healed my sicknesses, but also blessed me with a government job. This is the photograph of my swollen forehead when the evil spirit instructed me to commit suicide. This is a photograph of my injured leg. This is an illustration of a formidable supernatural being that injured me. My brother sketched it as per my instructions. This is a photograph of my children. The older one is 10 years old, and the younger one is 4 years old. Jesus blessed us with peace and joy. All right, thank you. So we just wanted to share those updates with you and, you know, address some tough stuff, but uh, that's the reality of what's happening there and, and what uh, they've experienced and so <clears throat> spiritual warfare is real, and if we fight in the flesh, we forget about that. We're fighting the wrong battle. And so 
We really need to be fighting in the spiritual realm and using the tools that the Lord gave us. And so um, keep the, the, the church planters and uh, the people in Asia in your prayers. Um, it's very dark over there, um, much different than here as far as spiritual stuff goes. Um, when we were there, we were going by a temple. It had big pillars like Greek pillars with snakes wrapped up it. And there was a guy in there just ringing the bell. And I was like, what's that guy doing? And Emily said, oh, he's trying to wake his God up so he can pray to him. And uh, I was like, wow, if I had to wake my God up, I, I should just do it myself. I'm more powerful than him, you know, he's sleeping or whatever. But um, there's just a heaviness there, and, and they have millions of different gods that they worship. And um, a lot of times they do sacrifices and other things like that. So there's real, uh, like what we read about in the Bible, you know, demon possession and spiritual warfare and things like that. So keep them in your prayers. And so today I wanted to share something with you guys that I've learned. You know, we go to Asia and teach the church planters, but uh, they've also taught me some things. And so I wanted to share that with you. And so today is about a change of perspective. And uh, you've heard me say this before, you know, when things get tough to press into the Lord and that, you know, I've seen them doing that. And it was really impactful on me because there's been times in my life where I get you know, upset at God or angry. Or, Why is this happening, Lord? Like, I didn't even do anything wrong. Why is, is this bad thing happening to me now? And it steals my joy instead of waiting expectantly to see what the Lord's going to do with that. And in India, they stu- they when they were telling me their troubles before it was translated, I from their body language, I thought they was going to get some good news. You know, they're like telling me all this stuff and their smile on their face. And I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be cool. I wonder what's going on. And it's like, oh, your dad just died. I'm so sorry. Like, you know, but they were like, oh, it's, God's so strong. He's so powerful. He's going to get me through this. But they were just excited what God was going to do. And they didn't focus on the pain and the suffering. They were just like, God is so great. My God is so good. You know, I just want to see what he can do. He can bring people back from the dead. He can heal people. And and that's what they were focusing on. And so they had their joy even in those tough times. And so... um. Let's wait expectantly for what God's going to do and see how he's going to use it for good or for his glory. Uh, like in Romans eight twenty eight, it says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So, and I'm going to encourage you a lot today, so I'll encourage you again. When you're facing tough times, to be grateful for them and to have joy, even if you don't feel happy, continue to press into the Lord. I learned through things in my own life that I can be joyful without being happy. I can, it doesn't have to steal my joy. I know that there's peace, like God's got it all worked out. I don't know why this situation's happening, you know, but he's so far ahead of me in the plan that he's laid out and where he's working that sometimes I can't see him. It feels like maybe he's not there because he's so far ahead of me, like a master chess player. You know, they set you up and you're thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to get your queen and boom. And then next thing you know, you just lost. You're like, how did that just happen? You know, God is like that you know, defeating Satan. He's already so far ahead. And in our lives, he's working continuously and and he cares about all the little things in our lives. So we see many examples of this in scripture where bad situations were used powerfully by the Lord. We see it in the book of Daniel and what happened to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, they were slaves and they became wise men and advisors to the king. Then, you know, not bad, right, for being a slave. A little bit of a high point. And then they were almost killed with all the other wise men in the land when they couldn't interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream, you know, until the Lord revealed that to Daniel. And then it says, Daniel remained in the the king's court, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were elevated to a high position in Babylon. Oh, not bad, right? So slaves, advisors, now they're in a higher position. So far, so good. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to worship the golden statue made by King Nebuchadnezzar, and then they were thrown into the fire. Now we're low point, right? I don't want to get thrown into the fire. That would be not so good. Then Nebuchadnezzar recognized that God was with them in the fire and elevated Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to an even higher position. God put them in just the right position for just the right time so that God's purpose would be carried out and he'd be glorified. So things that seem like we're going backwards in life or maybe aren't so good, God's using that to get us in the right place, the right time, Talk to the right people, be the right example for someone, personal growth to exemplify him and glorify him. 
And so he works in multifaceted ways. So, and then we know Daniel's story where he's later on, he's thrown in the lion's den by King Darius. But more on that later. So we, we also see this in, in Genesis with Joseph. In Genesis 37, 17, it says that he was sold into slavery and purchased by Potiphar, right? Low point. He got a fancy new coat, all these colors, and he's thinking, oh, life is good. I got this great coat. Look at me. You know, he probably wasn't prideful, but, you know, get a nice gift. You're excited. Then his brothers throw him in the pit, and then he gets sold as a slave. That's a low point, right? Oh, man, what a drag. And then in Genesis 39, 1 through 6, it says, When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh the king of Egypt. The Lord is with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the house of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. And this pleased Potiphar, so he made Joseph his personal attendant, putting him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake." which I think is cool because it wasn't for Potiphar's sake. It was because of Joseph that the Lord blessed his household. All his household affairs ran smoothly and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph, he didn't have to worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. So another little high point, right? Now you're kind of running the house, and things are probably pretty good. You're, sounds like his boss wasn't micromanaging him, you know. Oh, he just, I just want tacos tonight, you know. Oh, got it, sir. We're on it, you know. He didn't have to worry. Everything was good. So, good little high point. But Joseph, he was a good-looking guy. And Potiphar's wife saw that and wanted to have relations with Joseph. He did the right thing, ran away. But she lied, falsely accused, like we saw the guy in the video. You know, they accused him of taking bribes, and that's one of the things that is common there is that uh, church planners will come to a village and uh, give the gospel. If anyone converts, then they accuse them. Well, you must have bribed them, or you threatened them to get them to convert, and then they arrest them on those false charges. But then, in Genesis thirty-nine nineteen. The Lord, but the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love, and the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge over all other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no worries because Joseph took care of everything, and the Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. Not bad. Another little high point, right? So... Ups and downs, ups and downs. Make some progress, lose some progress. Then while Joseph was in jail, he interpreted the dreams of the of Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and three days later those dreams came true. The chief cupbearer had promised to talk to, jo- talk to Pharaoh, but forgot for two, for two full years. Well, that's kind of a bummer, right? You think, okay, I might get out. You know, I just helped this guy out. He's going to be restored to his position. Baker, sorry, man, you're going to get killed you know so guy gets out forgets to talk to pharaoh about it and you're just sitting in jail waiting what's happening your fate is hanging in the balance you know we all we don't we don't like the unknown and so he's just waiting another low point for joseph and then when pharaoh has two dreams the cupbearer remembers and talks to pharaoh and joseph was brought in front of the pharaoh to interpret his dreams and joseph did something very important he was sure to give God the glory. In Genesis 41, 16, it says, It's beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied, but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. So that's an important thing is to give God the glory. So Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, and Pharaoh honored him, elevating him to the highest position in all of Egypt except for Pharaoh himself. High point, right? Pretty cool. You know, if you did it the traditional way, you know, you would be like an employee and then like a supervisor, and then like middle management, and then upper management, and then an executive, and then maybe if you're lucky, CEO, you know. But he skipped all those steps. God got him in just the right position at just the right time, give him the right words, the wisdom. 
so things that feel bad and are set back and even though you know i'm sure he didn't know what was going to happen he's just thinking oh man i'm in jail okay now i'm you know servant for this guy but he just continued to press into the lord and he didn't lose, lose hope and he was faithful and that shows through how he managed the affairs of his masters you know he did the best job he could and the lord blessed that So this results in him saving many of the people of Egypt with his wisdom. You know, the Lord warned him about the famine that was coming in seven years, and they were able to prepare and save a lot of people through that, and ultimately even saving his family, you know, his brothers that threw him in the pit, reuniting them, families back together. So God put Joseph in a special place. Uh, Joseph would not have had these opportunities to even speak to Pharaoh as a common person, and this is a little bit of a foreshadowing of what Jesus would say in the New Testament to his disciples in Luke 21, 12 through 15, when he was speaking of the future. He said, but before all this occurs, there will be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged into synagogues and prisons, and you will stand trial before kings and governors because you are my followers. And this is the part I like. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. So don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you. For I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Which I think is pretty cool. Like if we wanted to call up, you know, well, we won't use the current president. But if we wanted to call up Trump, President Trump, do you guys have his phone number? I don't either. And there's probably like a million gatekeepers, you know, staff, managers, all these people that would just make it impossible for us to talk to him. But... God was able to circumvent all that with Joseph, and he was able to get right in front of the Pharaoh at just the right time and win favor with him because of what the Lord was doing. So even though we feel like we're going backwards or we have setbacks, those things are going to be used by God powerfully. And so now, instead of me getting upset, I get excited, like, oh, this is a pretty bad situation. I wonder what the Lord's going to do with this. How's he going to use this? Because it's going to be 10 times better than this bad situation is. So now you might be asking yourself, why do these hard things happen, and was it their fault? Was it because of sin? We can find some of the answers to this in John 9, 1 and 2, when Jesus heals the blind man. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? So they already had decided it was either like this or this, you know. It's sin, but it was his own sin or his parents' sin. And Jesus said, no, neither one of those things. It was not because of his sin or his parents' sin, Jesus answered. This happened so that the power of God would be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. And I think that's pretty cool. You know, it would be a bummer to be blind for 18 years, and then boom, God restores your sight. But how cool is that, that God had that specific purpose for him just so that he could use him to be glorified, to show his power. And God wants to do that through all of us. So we're in those situations. That's a great time, you know, coworkers might be watching, non-believers, and they're like, why are you happy? This doesn't make any sense, you know? It's a great time to, to tell them about Jesus. And so when those things happen, just be joyful, look at them as opportunities, and how can I use this to honor the Lord? What is God doing here? And God works in many different ways, you know, multifaceted. He works in the spiritual realm, in the earthly realm, in your life, in my life, all through the same situation. And when I was younger, I didn't see that. I just saw, you know, okay, Jesus died on the cross to save our sins, but I was totally oblivious to the fact of what he was doing in the spiritual realm as well. So, God has given us the distinct honor of partnering with him to fulfill his plan. And he could do a much better job than me at the things he's asked me to do. You know, like today teaching. If Jesus was here, it would be way better. <laughs> you know, he could do so much better. But he uses us, and he's already factored in all of our dumb mistakes, our misconceptions, our sadness, and all that. And so, it's, you know... When I would talk to someone about Jesus and they didn't accept Christ right away, I'd be like, oh man, I failed. I'm so sad, you know. But then I'd be like, I can't be the linchpin in God's plan. Like, I'm the one thing. I was like, no. 
get off your high horse, Stanley. <laughs> you're not the only <laughs> linchpin in this plan. He's already factored that in. You know, when you feel like you're supposed to talk to somebody, but you get scared or nervous or you don't know what to say, maybe that is just preparation for the next time you're ready. You know, so God's already got all that factored in. So don't worry. So in Romans 12, 6 through 8, it says, In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. So we all have different gifts, and they all work together. Like when people are kind to us, that's awesome. You know, when they're generous, that's awesome. When we have someone that knows what to do in a situation, and they can lead the rest of us through that, that's awesome. And so all those parts work together. And so whatever your part is, maybe your part is just kindness, and it feels like, well, that's not that big of a gift. But really, that is a huge gift. So none are better than the others, but they all work together together at just the right time, in just the right place. So let's quickly carry out the tasks that God's given us. So if we graphed out Joseph's life, it might look something like this. So if we can put up slide one. You know, we got ups and downs, highs and lows. I'm thinking, oh man, we're making some progress, but we're losing some ground. You know, kind of like the stock market sometimes. <laughs> So then if we change our perspective and we rotate that graph, now it looks like a roadmap. God's maneuvering us, avoiding danger, obstacles, getting us just in the right position, God being glorified through our actions. So now that graph isn't highs and lows anymore. We're just navigating through life. But if we flip that one more time and we look at it, you know, so if this was our two-dimensional graph and we turn it on edge, it looks like a straight line, right? And that's God's plan for our life, his sovereignty over everything. To God, we're not swerving out of the way. We're not going this way, that way. We're going exactly where we should be, right at the right time. And so change your perspective and think of things like that. How is this going to affect my life? How can this affect someone else's life? What can God do through this? And wait expectantly. Anybody have dogs? Yeah. You ever been in the kitchen, like, cutting cheese, and they're just like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You know, they, they're fully expecting to get that cheese. They're not like, oh, man, he's probably not going to give me some, that guy, you know. I feel like that's how, you know, we should be to God. Just look at him expecting, like, what are you going to do, Lord? This is going to be so awesome. I don't know what it is, but it's going to be amazing. So those are the, the things that I've learned from the church planters, and... Uh, just remember, God's sovereign over everything, and what He does in our life, these examples, can help us grow personally, increase our faith, or as an encouragement to others, so that not that we may not know are even watching. So and we just want to make sure God receives all the glory for that, too, and not take it on ourselves. You know, sometimes when we say stuff, we want to sound cool and like smart and all this, but maybe the person hearing it needs you to speak in a language they understand. And you, you think, man, I didn't say that very eloquently. Like, I know the Bible better than this. Why couldn't I? I'm stumbling all over myself. But that's how they needed to receive it. It wasn't about us looking cool or sounding fancy or being the smartest because that wouldn't have resonated with them and it wouldn't have reached their heart. So keeping in mind Colossians 2.15 it says, in, the, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And so we look at the cross in our earthly perspective, but he was doing something in the heavenly realm that we didn't know much, anything about either. You know, Satan probably thought, yeah, we got him. He was in that puny human body. And we just squished him and we won. And then God shamed him, you know, with what he was doing. And so he's doing stuff for us, just like with Job, you know. Thousands of years later, we're reading about all the stuff he went through and the suffering and the setbacks and all that. And it was not because of Job's sin, because he was God's faithful servant. It was because he, he was putting Satan in his place. And he was like, oh, okay, you want to do that? Test Job, test my faithful servant and see. And Satan, I think, learned a lesson, you know. He, he didn't 
curse God and die. He kept on being faithful and pressing into the Lord after losing. I mean, I don't think you could lose much more than what Job lost, you know. And he was faithful, and God restored twice to him what it was. So keep that in mind, and hopefully that's an encouragement to you all. Um, so I'll have the worship team come back up, and we'll close in a, in a song. Um, I'll show a short video, and then they're going to sing this song. But this video explains the origin of the song and where it came from. And this is one of the people groups that we work with, where the Christian school is right now. And so... Um, Paging Adam to the drums, Adam to the drums. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Man, you're sneaky. Cancel, Adam, cancel. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. In 1904, revival swept across Wales. God made himself known in a very special and personal way. After the revival, a Welshman ventured halfway across the world to India, and he trekked up the mountains towards a remote village in the east. He was told, go back. The tribe in that village are famously violent. But the Welshman ignored the warnings because even these savage headhunters should have the opportunity to hear about the mercy of God. One tribesman and his family heard the gospel and received Jesus as their savior. The good news was too good to keep to themselves, and they shared the gospel with others in the tribe. The chief was very angry, and he had the tribesman and his family dragged before the village. Stop following Jesus, the chief demanded. The tribesman replied, No, I have decided to follow Jesus. I am not turning back. The chief was furious and killed the tribesman's children. Stop following Jesus, the chief insisted. The tribesman replied, Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back. The chief showed no mercy, and he killed the tribesman's wife. Now you will stop following this Jesus, the chief said. The tribesman looked the chief in the eyes and replied, The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. The chief could not believe his ears and he killed the tribesman. Jesus said, if a grain of wheat dies, it bears much fruit. And that day, many of the villagers who witnessed the persecution of that tribesman and his family also decided to follow Jesus. Even the chief himself became a follower of Jesus Christ. The tribesman's last words became the song of the village, and today it is sung all around the world, I have decided to follow Jesus.